my name is Johan Hedberg. I'm going to talk about latency improvement in BizTalk. But I would like to start by just thanking, you know, I guess I would have to thank Saravana, and I guess I'll have to thank Kent as well for this picture floating around here with me wearing the, oh, he's thumbs up over there. I hope he's the only Canadian in the room as well. Uh, me floating around there wearing that, you know, Canadian hockey jersey. And for you who were here last year, you probably remember me having to wear that thing. Uh, he tried getting me to wear it this year as well. I politely uh, declined. So the only kind of uh, thing I want to then emphasize on this slide is the fact that no, I'm not Canadian, you know. I'm Swedish, even though we do have our, our disagreements probably like once or twice a year when there, there's the uh, World Hockey Championships. That's, you know, the origin of that, that shirt and that picture. So the goal of this presentation is to uh, go through a bit of BizTalk performance. And originally, I was just, you know, BizTalk performance. So I kind of narrowed that down to being design your BizTalk solution for performance. And then, you know, we ended up being having half an hour. So it's kind of like, well, why, I need to narrow that down even more. So that went down to defining, designing your BizTalk orchestration for performance and your, your BizTalk you know, architecture uh, for performance and for, for latency, right? So this goes kind of along the lines of, uh, of Steven's presentation yesterday as well, with kind of some tips and tricks for things that you need to think about and things I've seen that often go wrong. And I'm basing this on a real world scenario, or I shouldn't really say a, world, a real world scenario, so someone's gonna feel singled out. Um, this is actually something that I've seen at a number of clients and customers I've been at, these number of different you know, mistakes that they do, and they end up in a situation where they will think that this, this platform, this solution, is something that can't give me performance. And I'm gonna show you the couple of steps that you can, that you can take that will actually you know, go from that original solution to something that does perform according to requirements. Um, a lot of you probably will, will recognize some of these, uh, and I guess there will be another couple of people that will go like, yeah, I, sh I know I should do that, but you know, I'm not really doing that. So a couple of reminders as well for you out there. So the first thing here, always when you kind of do this, this kind of thing, you need to have a method to it, right? You don't just go ahead and, and think that I'm gonna improve performance, hmm, what am I gonna do? I, I, I believe there's something wrong over here. I, I see that often as well. But you really need to kind of think about how you go about this. And you need to you know, develop your solution, you need to test your solution, and based on those results, you need to decide on what you need to tune. And you need to tune a single thing and then you need to move on to the next thing, right? So instrumentation is, is one of the key aspects in this. And I see very little uh, instrumentation happening out there. So instrument, instrumenting your solution is really, really important. So in Best Talk, there are a lot of different you know, ways to instrument your solution. And there's all the, the upper row things here. There are uh, you know, built-in ways that you can instrument BizTalk. Uh, the built-in performance counter is obviously important with throttling and with persistence points and stuff like that. But one of the things I see underused very, very much is the custom performance counters. So today I only have uh, 30 minutes, but to plug the integration Mondays as well, uh, I actually have the integration Monday coming up on, on uh, Monday. So either you're all kind of peaked and, and excited to get on that as well, or you're all just gonna be so tired of integration that you don't want to. Uh, but to kind of plug that a little bit, I'm gonna go into depth on uh, custom performance counters and you can use you know, your own performance counters measuring your solution uh, within BizTalk on, as one of the things I'll talk more about on Monday. Um, obviously, trace and login statements and exception handling are other things that are hugely important for you to, to use. So this particular case were, were, were built around the 3 tier architecture. And there is nothing wrong with, with you know, having an architecture in place. And I see this, you know, this was one of Steven's points uh, last, uh, last uh, night or uh, in the afternoon, uh, where you will have a you know, .NET developer. And I'm, I'm not bashing .NET developers. I consider myself a .NET developer. It's just, you know, they come from, we come from a, you know, a, a background where three-tier architectures are kind of the norm, or have been the norm for a lot of years. Now, stuff are moving into microservices, sure, but it's been there for a long time. So building uh, according to this architecture and perhaps having a naming standard around that 
is obviously a good thing, but it's also one of the kind of common mistakes when you combine that with how BizTalk works. So in this particular case, or cases actually, what they've done was that they've used that 3 tier architecture and then they've you know, used the publish subscribe pattern, you know, over architected that thing, again, over architected that thing to decide that, well, we're gonna use that, we're gonna divide our orchestrations into that pattern and we're gonna use the message box continuously for communication through, uh, uh, between those, those different layers. So there's nothing wrong with that. There's a number of very good patterns in use there. Um, it's just, in this case, it's a matter of matching your, your requirements to the patterns that you actually apply to your solution. So if you had a requirement that said that you need to have this loosely coupled, you need to have this as replaceable as possible, you might even use things like an itinerary or you might be uh, using some other ways of, of looking up the next step to have like a state engine or something like that. But in this case, one of the primary uh, requirements always were that we're aiming for a response time of about one second, right? So in this case, this, this is an issue. You're not building an architecture and you're designing your solution according to your requirements. So in this case, in a lot of the places as well, uh, and I know this could be a slightly harder to see on the screen, but the, the circles here to the right of the screen then means that they're reusing a couple of other orchestrations as part of this. And they're actually building those orchestrations, obviously, according to the same pattern and according to the same design. Not only that, they're choosing an isolation level where they say that, well, this looking up authorization and debiting and charging the customer for this transaction is actually something that in itself is valid enough to be uh, an integration in itself. So they're sending data out through a send port and into a receive port back into BISO, right? So they've chosen that level of reuse. And the middle layer then has kind of the same model. In this case, what we're doing is we're looking up some vehicle information. And vehicle information in this case is combined of a, two major different sources. So one of those is actually looking up information about the individual vehicle. Like what's the status? Is it in traffic? Is it, does it have a ticket? Does it have a credit mark on it? And it's also based on model information. So information about the weight and the height of the car, uh, how many you know, horsepower or, or uh, is in the engine or how uh, much uh, you know, fuel does it use or something like that, those kind of stuff. You need, really need to combine those to return a result to the, uh, uh, to the requester. And we're also using a map here because what we get returned is a, you know, a color code. We need to look up a color and we need to return that as well. So that's basically part of the scenario. Uh, the bottom layer in this case isn't really doing all that much. Uh, it's just, you know, retrieving the actual data from the back end. So part of the solution, part of the architecture here was that you're using orchestrations all over the place, right? Which, I mean, there's a couple of stuff happening in there that's not really important for the solution, like error handling, logging, stuff like that. Uh, so it's not that it's without any use. And we're using canonical messaging and everything, like those kind of pattern here, here as well. So if you combine that solution uh, in total, uh, you can see that there's a lot of things going on here. There's a lot of orchestrations, there are a lot of, you know, a lot of things happening. So when the happy developer then puts this into acceptance testing or, you know, heaven forget, even production, uh, what we end up uh, with is 16 seconds. And 16 seconds is pretty far off from, from being, you know, the one second requirement, right? It's beautifully designed, beautifully architecture, it has a lot of you know, patterns uh, around isolation, around thinking about the application lifecycle management for these specific you know, uh, I integrations in themselves, how you're gonna deploy them and everything like that. So it's, it's nice, but it's not meeting requirements. So I'm not gonna, it would be wrong to put this as the first problem, but the first thing you need to work around obviously in this case is the message box. If you want want to lower your or improve your performance and improve your, your latency, right? So why is this a problem? Because this solution is 38 message box hops, right? And at this point in time, we're also doing 38 message box hops in a non-optimized you know, uh, message box. So that kind of puts us as 11 seconds just for the, the message box part, right? And I, you know, I love the message box, love publish, subscribe, but it's sometimes not according to requirements. Right? according to the, the things that need, you need to apply to BizTalk. So reducing message box hops is the first solution. So instead of doing this, you could do this. 
All right, you can use the orchestrations as you would use a function uh, or a method in .NET or your favorite language, right? You could call that thing. You don't need to, you know, go through a database every time you need to go to a new function. So nesting orchestrations this way uh, and doing that not only for the main scenario but also for the sub-scenarios here. Still doing reuse on the still same level, still calling BizTalk and into BizTalk again, but actually applying the patterns to all of those integrations as well as, you know, this is the middle layer in this case, the model information here has the same pattern applied. And the bottom, you know, layer in this case is an affected yet. So that brings the number of message box hops down to 20, 22. If you're not counting, you just have to take my word for it. Brings it down to 22. Which, again, then if you count that at an average of 300 milliseconds, brings us down to 7 seconds, right? Which then, as it turns out, when you go in and view your instrumentation and measure these things, brings the total call time, in this case, down to 10 seconds, right? So the next thing then that you can do with, with this pattern that you have, this architecture that you have at the moment, is obviously considering your layer of reuse. Uh, there's nothing wrong, doesn't have to be anything wrong with do, having a SEM port and calling into BizTalk again, but you obviously you can do reuse on different levels. So without kind of damaging the architecture, uh, without violating any of its core rules, uh, instead of doing this, where you go outside of BizTalk through a SEM port, through the internet, or at least the local network, and into a C port again to reach the new orchestration, you could do this. From a three-tier architecture, and from a standpoint where you have a consumer facade, you have a canonical kind of processing layer, and you have a backend provider, there's nothing wrong with doing this, right? Reusing on the level of the canonical messages. Often that's the reason why we would have canonical messages at all, well, one of it, there's a lot of other you know, isolation on all of that as well, but they're the, the, the common, kind of inter, common message format that can, you can do reuse on. So doing that kind of changes the, the layout of this solution a bit. Uh, more, most notably, you'll have, instead of doing you know, uh, send through uh, send port and receive through a receive port and into another integration, we're choosing now to call yet another orchestration on the level of uh, the processing layer, right? Which brings the number of message box call, uh, hops again down to 10, which at an average of 300 brings us down to three seconds. So already we're at a hugely you know, beneficial level compared to where we started, and it's all quite simple. Now, some of you might be thinking that, hey, well, come on, now you've tightly coupled all of these things. That's not good. And, you know, it might not be. I'm not you know, claiming that this is the, you know, one solution to solve all of your problems. I'm saying, according to the requirements that we started with and according to the solution that you started with, this is, these things are one of the things that you can do to, to get lower. And in this case, we're at a point where we have five seconds overall response time. So we're quickly getting there, right? So right now, this is what the solution looks like. Uh, we're calling out for authorization of the user, we're charging the user for the uh, transaction, uh, we're uh, calling the backend provider to get car, uh, car information for this specific car, we're mapping to get color and a different couple of different other things done here, and we're looking at the model information between, before we return that data. So obviously there are a couple of things here where you can obviously apply caching. I mean, caching is one of the major uh, you know, patterns to use when you want to improve performance everywhere. And I, I seldom see it used enough, right? So there are two kind of victims that I would choose here for using caching. Um, one of them is the authorization call over there. There's no reason why you would look up authorization each and every time. So in this case, I should say as well, this is not like Active Directory, unfortunately. This is, you know, your custom database somewhere, you know, in this case, both times this particular thing happened. It's even, you know, data in the mainframe, which you know, is an anti-pattern perhaps in itself, but there it is. Um, so there's no reason why you shouldn't read that data, that full amount of data, because memory today is inexpensive and easy to cache this information, unless, of course, you have like millions and millions and millions of customers, which then you might go another way. But in this case, the customers were like in the hundreds of thousands, and it was basically okay to read that thing in memory. And at the very least, read the 
you know, the authorization for that specific customer so that when you return for that specific customer, you won't have to you know, go get that specific customer's authorization again. Of course, you do have to refresh that data, but the refreshing of that data can also be out of band, doesn't need to be in the integration itself. And the other thing over here is the uh, lookup for color and stuff like that, which is obviously something that you would cache as well. So caching in this case doesn't influence us very, very much, but it does bring us down to 4.4 seconds. So the next thing to look at here is, is how could we optimize this even further? So this consumer facade over here, it does a couple of things, right? It checks authorization, it charges the customer, it maps to the canonical format of the message, and it you know, calls downstream. So obviously, one of the things you would look at here is, why do you do things in this order? Why do you, why do you need to charge the customer before you retrieve the data? So just rearranging things, just you know, considering what do I really need to uh, achieve here and what order is obviously something that you uh, easily can do. So instead of debiting the customer before you retrieve the response, you can obviously just move that to something that you would do after you, you return that result, right? Which, again, brings us down additionally to 3.8 seconds. So in this case, uh, I've been talking about the orchestration and the patterns and a couple of different things you can do here, but you know, kind of like the elephant in the room here has always been you know, you're doing the, this at an average of 300 milliseconds for the message box, for example. And I said I'm not going, going to do, you know, I don't have time to do infrastructure. I don't have time to do, you know, platform configuration. I don't have time to do SQL. I don't have time to do, you know, all that low-level disk and everything that you need to do to have a well-performing environment. All of those things hugely important, but not something that I would get to, you know, today in 30 minutes. But one of the things I would like to do here is just considering the host settings that we're using for this. So there's you know, a couple of different things that are hugely important for you to configure for your business environment. And again, there's not like there's one configuration that will solve your problems. There is probably one configuration for your problems, but it's one for you, for you, for you, for you. So it's all you know, different and has to conform to your, your requirements, your solutions, right? You're always going to get this question, how many messages per second can I do on BizTalk? So, well, you know, I could give you an answer, but it's based on so many assumptions that it wouldn't mean anything to you. It's like 83. And someone here over here goes, what do you mean 83? I can do 2,000. Well, you know, it's different requirements. So you need to obviously go through this and, and configure them to your scenario. So one of the things here, obviously, that I'm going to focus on for this scenario, for this thing, um, is just bringing down the polling interval from, from that 500 to that 50, right? Which brings us down to a uh, comfortable 2.2 seconds in this case. So then, and the next thing for this uh, that I'm going to uh, apply is inline sense. So inline sense is actually the second thing that I would like to deep dive into on Monday, because it's also one of those things that I've seen that people do understand that you can do them, and they do understand that, hey, I can you know, change this SEM port to being where I can do that lookup into a web service or a database, something like that, from code. That's perfectly OK. I know how to do that. So most of the cases, though, I've seen people using WCF proxy classes for that, which if you, you know, look at this a bit, the way that Bistock represents a message going out through a SEM port differs from the way that a you know, code-generated WCF proxy represents a message going out through that proxy, right? Which, if you have a couple of complex maps mapping into that target schema, that's going to be a problem for you to, uh, to change into inline sense, if you do it that way. But there are ways that you can do that using you know, more raw WCF class classes that will actually represent the message the same way that Bistock does, that makes it very, very easy for you to do that switch. And that's the second thing I'm going to you know, show you and go deeper into on, on Monday. Sorry about that for today. So, but applying this technique then, not only again to this particular, you know, main scenario, but also to my other scenarios here that are reused by the scenario, I'll bring the time down to 1.9 seconds, according to my tests. Right, which kind of brings us down to the next point here, which is back to our instrumentation. I really need to understand at this point, now that I've applied some of the you know, more obvious 
uh, techniques here. I really need to understand what's the next thing for me. Where do I go, need to go next? So particularly uh, those performance counters that I would say are my custom performance counters, I will place strategically at places around my orchestration. I mean, obviously, you can do things like DTA tracking. And there's a couple of us uh, before, I remember a Towards talk from last year, for example, where these DTA in-out debug events, like don't, you know, if you're a developer, you want to use them, don't. I'm not sure if it's in the room still, but you know, don't. Especially in production, don't. And even if you do, most of the time that's, you know, if you use things like tools like the orchestration profiler, that's thing that you can do, go look up after the fact, right? And the custom performance count just really gives you kind of a view into what's happening, you know, right now. How is it performing right now? And that's what your performance counter is for. So by using those, or by using, you know, the means of, of instrumentation that we have, you can find out that, well, your backend calls in this case, <coughs> looking up the vehicle, you know, specific individual vehicle information, that's fast, that's at 150 milliseconds. Looking up data for the model information, now that's one second. And that kind of goes back to, you know, one of Steven's points last night as well, where, you know, as a BizDoc developer, you often end up having to prove that it's not your fault, right? I can show you that the response time is one second from that point. So I can't, regardless of what I do in my solution, I can't improve that response time. But most of the time, that's very easy. You know, you can go talk to those guys. They're, most of the time, it's, you know, you, not, you work with nice people, so no problem. So in this particular uh, case then that I referred to here, yeah, we went and talked to those guys, and we say we're, we're you know, querying this information, and we're seeing that uh, the response times are, are quite high. Can you do something about that? And they said, sure, I, I, you know, I'll run some tuning, and I recognize that I'm not using the indexes that I should. So I'll, I'll tune that for you and we went down to 100 milliseconds. So in this case, this was data retrieved from a database that we have in-house, or that the customer had in-house. And that's something that could be easily tuned, right? So data from a database, you probably know this, that if you do that the wrong way, that response time can easily you know, increase. But if you do it the right way, use the indexes as you should, that's something that can be easily improved as well, which in this case it was. So now we're down to one second, which is basically the requirement that we need to meet, right? But I'm gonna throw one other thing in here, because uh, it's something that's so very often mentioned when you talk about you know, improving orchestration performance, which is persistence points, right? And persistence points, you often see these kind of patterns. A pattern where, well, you have some kind of transaction that you don't really need. You have you know, tracing code, and then you have your response shape, and then you have your tracing code again to say, I'm done, right? That's, you know, that's often the case, especially from you know, developers that don't really, they don't really understand what's happening inside the orchestration. So they think that, well, putting out all these trait statements, I'll, I'll get it, I'll understand it, right? So in this kind of pattern, uh, really uh, prohibits or prevents the, the messaging engine to optimize performance count, or sorry, not performance count, persistence points, right? So what you should do, obviously, is not use code that overuses transactions, so if there's no need. A lot of the time, what I see is that people will, if they find out that a piece of code that they want to use needs a transaction, they'll put a transaction there. They won't go like, well, pff, how can I improve this code or do something else to actually not use that transaction? They'll just a transaction there, because that's what BizDoc's telling them, right? Visual Studio's telling them you need a transaction. Yeah, I'll put one there, right? So a lot of time you can work around those kind of things to do something different, slightly different, where you don't need that uh, transaction. And you don't really need to you know, trace that you're done as the final thing you do. If you can avoid that, we can get this down to one uh, persistence point instead of in this sample three. So the, the thing here with my particular, uh, when I you know, put up this solution and, and tried all these things out, I actually didn't get a huge benefit out of this. So don't take that as you won't, because you, you will. Definitely at the level where you have big messages, where you have a lot of var variables that you, especially when you treat them in a way that you shouldn't, you put everything on the orchestration level scope, all your messages, all your variables, 
then you know, the, the actual size of the orchestration that needs to be serialized, that needs to be persisted, will be quite big. Uh, for me, in my case, where I put you know, my messages and my variables on the scopes that I needed them in, et cetera, et cetera, and the messages were actually quite small, you know, I could, I, it, when I did this, and, and it was more than moving from three to one, um, I, it, I wanted it to mean more. Uh, I wanted to show you that it means more. But I traced this even down to the uh, you know, database level, and what happens is that since I had so small amount of data, each and everything that was you know, done towards the database was basically zero or one or eight at the, you know what I mean, the, the, the top highest kind of thing as far as duration and cost towards the message box. But if, as you go up and up and up in, in size, this will definitely matter more to you. But anyway, we're down to 0 0.95. Feeling kind of good about that. So that basically took us from 16 seconds to below one second in this case, which, believe it or not, is a 16 times improvement. So I've overshot my goal here, uh, definitely, by just applying a few different techniques. So this is kind of the summary of what we did. I'm not going to read all this. This is more like if you get the slides afterwards, you can summarize it. So I'll, I'll, I'll pause for a second here, because I see a lot of mobile phones going up. But the conclusion then anyway is that there's no, really no one size fits all. I'm, I'm, I'm not saying that you know, this, doing this will solve your problems. I'm saying doing this solved the particular requirements that were, were the ones that were important for this solution. Because this was, you know, this is a web service call. It's like a customer will use this inside of their system to supply their customers with, with this you know, important information and data. You can't have that taking 16 seconds, or they, they will go crazy. Now, as well, obviously, you can. We did move down additionally from this 0 0.95 seconds. Uh, but during the course of these 30 minutes here, that's, you know, this is as far as we get. And there are a lot of best practices in this. And then there are a couple of practices in this. And again, that you, know, you have to decide which you're going to apply. Uh, and you have to kind of avoid some of the, 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 the things that you believe might be best practices and look at what are you actually going to do to, to solve your problem, right? And again, really do emphasize that when you tune things, you should really go about this by, by testing, getting you know, empirical evidence what's, what the issue is, fixing that particular thing, and then you know, testing again to validating uh, what you've done, right? And again, how you do it, how you optimize, the steps you take will change the requirements of your solution. So I applied inline sense. I applied, you know, call to message box, uh, or uh, sorry, call to orchestrations instead of message box. This will create a situation where, obviously, you will have a higher amount of uh, data in memory. You will have, you know, you will steal threads or hold on to threads for a longer period of time, since it now holds on to that thread for the entire time of the duration. It will hold stuff in memory for a longer time. It won't go to the message box. It won't consume disk. It will consume other resources. So at the same time that you change your solution, you may need to think about if you're going to change your environment as well and the resources that you can use. Right? So obviously looking at other performance counters like memory, disk, processor, etc., at the same time that you're looking at your specific scenario needs to happen as well. But I think I've shown in a way that you can definitely uh, you know, apply some, you know, some, some very basic thoughts and, and uh, you know, techniques to your solutions to bring that them down from that uh, additionally quite high uh, estimate to something that's quite lower. That's it. Thank you.